Hello, everyone. I'm Kimberly Kane, President and CEO of Kane Communications Group, and welcome. It's great to have you with us here at the noon hour on a Friday afternoon. The COVID-19 pandemic has sparked a number of paradigm shifts that we are all dealing with. Where we work, how we work, how we interact with each other, and how we sell. The traditional sales model came to a screeching halt in 2020. A global survey, in fact, a B2B survey, um, indicated that there have been significant changes uh, in the way people are interested in being sold to and in the way that we are selling. More than half of those surveyed say that we're going to go to more of a virtual sales model uh, in the way we're interacting with and selling uh, our services and our product. And that is really changing the way we're thinking about sales. It's changing the way we're planning and it's changing the way we're going about doing our work. So how do we do this without courtside seats to sporting events, without endless dinners and drinks out and coffee meetings? Um, and really we don't have the option of just kind of saying, I was in the neighborhood, so I thought I would drop by. How are sales executives finding new ways to remain relevant, uh, to empathize uh, with our prospects and to pivot the pitch and close deals? Well, we are joined by a panel of executives to learn what's working and what's not to close new deals and win back business that was lost during the 2019 uh, COVID pandemic. I'm sorry, during the COVID-19 pandemic, here we're experiencing that in 2020. So joining us, you can see the faces up at the top of the screen and the faces and the names along the slide. We have Christine McMahon, CEO of Christine McMahon and Associates LLC, a firm that focuses on culture, leadership and sales. We have Steve Palak, Chief Marketing Officer of Ergens, a full service commercial real estate developer, well known around the Milwaukee, Chicago and Phoenix areas. And James Burnett, Director of Public Relations here at Kane Communications Group. Thank you so much to all of you for being with us. It's great to see you in your homes and your offices. And James, I look forward to learning about the background <laughs> for, for your Zoom meeting. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, Really, before we dive in, what I'd like to do is turn to our audience for just a minute. Thank all of you, of course, for joining us. Our goal all, always is to uh, make sure that these panel discussions are informed by you uh, and they're interactive. So what I'd like you to do uh, if you're joining us uh, here as a participant uh, in the webinar is chat something to us about yourself. What industry are you in? Um, tell us what is one thing that you are hoping to learn through uh, this discussion today. As you chat those answers to us, I'd also like to let everyone know uh, that our next webinar is coming up in two weeks, July 10th, and we'll focus on executive branding in the digital world. You can register for that webinar uh, on our website later on today. So to keep us on track, here's just a little bit of housekeeping. Those of you who have joined us in the past know how this works. We're gonna talk with each panelist for about seven to eight minutes or so. And then we'll open things up for questions um, with the entire group uh, at about 30 to 35 minutes after the hour. Throughout this webinar, I really want to encourage all of you to chat any comments or questions in as we're going. Something may hit you top of mind that you're really interested in learning about because Sarah Frasick, our VP of Marketing and Strategy, is fantastic at pulling your questions out of that chat and bringing them into uh, the conversation so we can have a really robust discussion that's informed not just by my, by my questions, but they're really informed by your questions and what you want to learn. So now that we have that behind us, you guys all ready to get started? Okay, fantastic. Christine, we're gonna put you uh, on the spot first. Um, Christine, you're the CEO of Christine McMahon and Associates, a firm that fo focuses on culture, leadership, and sales. You shared a really interesting um, fact with me earlier uh, about small businesses and how small businesses in the US are the backbone of our economy. Small businesses generate the most jobs here in the United States. Mm -hmm. So as a consultant who works with so many small businesses, what are some of the challenges your clients are experiencing today? What are they bringing to you? Um, well, it's really interesting. I think it's the spectrum as we can imagine. Um, there has been um, a tremendous upheaval in the world that we know and how we operate. Um, I was talking with a, um, a tool and die company, been a client of mine for about a year and a half, and about four or five years ago, they diversified and um, went into CNC and they also went into medical. And what's really interesting is we were reconnecting 
their tool and die business fell off the table, as you can imagine, but they have tripled their CNC and they've actually hired six people during this transition and potentially going to hire more and the same with the medical. So a big part of what we're seeing depends upon the level of diversification. It depends upon the ability to be agile and to adjust. Um, it depends upon the backlog. I have a almost $300 million company that I work with. They have a two year backlog. So in one respect, sadly enough, this has actually been a little bit of an opportunity to give them a chance to catch up and to live and hopefully, hopefully <laughs> be able to shorten that. So there's, from a sales perspective, the challenge really becomes, um, how do I sell now? Mm -hmm. you know, that's the challenge. What's the best way? And it really depends upon how you're going to market, who your key decision makers are. Um, I will share with you a lot of the people that I work with, they're getting through to CEOs and they weren't able to do that before. And a lot of the CEOs say, I'll take a 15 minute Zoom meeting with you but I wouldn't take an hour face to face. And what's happening is it's condensing the salespeople's um, investment of time because it would have been a half an hour to drive there, an hour to meet with them, another half hour to drive back, and they can jump on a call and in 15 minutes. And a lot of the people that I'm talking to are telling me, and I'm having the same experience, you get to the emotional level of the conversation quicker. Mm -hmm. You know, a quick question, um, kind of to advance what you're talking about right there. Do you think even CEOs are looking for things that are different? So business is far from usual right now. Do you think CEOs or leaders and companies maybe even open to taking those calls because they're interested in learning what's out there? Um, I think everyone's curious and I'm not, I think it's Sarah, if you could actually pull up, um, slide one, please, the next slide. Um, you know, the, the world that we're operating now, I call a VUCA world, and I'd love to tell you why I came up with that. I didn't. It was actually a term that was coined by the U.S. Military Academy, and it really captures, I think, the experience that all of us are having at this moment. And what it stands for is volatility. Um, and volatility is not just things are changing. This is about the speed and the volume and the impact of what's happening and COVID has certainly changed our lives. I mean, if any, if any of us think about this, if any of us were to sit back and say, you know, I think most of the corporations in America should have all of their employees work from home. What would that conversation would have been like? It would have been six months of conversations. It would have been, um, you know, test markets. We would have had conversation. And guess what? Most people would have come back and said, no, that's ridiculous. Yet in 48 hours, we made it happen. Mm -hmm. That's volatility. But in this, there's still uncertainty because we don't have a playbook for this. Mm -hmm. This has never happened in the world before. And this is a global situation. And even we're finding here in the United States, we now have barriers going up about which states you can go in and which you can't, depending upon where you've been and what's happened. That's never happened to us before in our lifetimes. So we have leaders who are facing this volatility, this uncertainty, the complexity. Oh my goodness, you know, the convergence of issues on top of COVID, we now have Black Lives Matters and protests and we have police issues. We have a lot of things um, emerging simultaneously, which is making for, um, I would go back to the word volatile situation. You know, we have to plan. And then the ambiguity, what do I do? You know, what is, what is the next step? And if, um, if we could advance to the next slide, what I'd like to say is when we look at this as leaders, as sales professionals, one of the things that we need to do is we need to have a vision because people need, need people want to be led. We want to be collaborative. We want to work together and we all want to be moving in the same direction. So it's about alignment. And even if, that vision isn't the three to five year that you're looking. It might only be a week, folks. But let's communicate that and let's move to the next slide if you'd be so kind. And that vision, what it does is it shifts that uncertainty, okay? Everything in my life has just changed, everything. I mean, how many executives do you know um, became school teachers mm -hmm. overnight? And the stress that that imposed on the family. So how... What does this do to all of us? Well, we have this vision, but we need to understand as a sales organization, what are your expectations of me? And what's, 
what is it that I need to be doing? So it's important as leaders that we communicate on a very frequent basis because that builds stability in the organization. Um, clarity. This is, this is really important because we, because the situation is so complex, we need multiple stakeholders to be sitting around the table and having the conversation. So if you're in manufacturing, you want to be having the head of operations, the head of finance, the head of HR, the head of sales, you know, you go, we want everybody to be having a conversation because we need to have one conversation mm -hmm. and we need those multiple perspectives because no one person has the right answer. We have one of the things I like about this slide, Christine, is the context that it provides to those of us who are looking for a place to get started. And I think that's one of the challenges I hear from people who are in sales is the landscape is so different. It's hard for me to know even where or how to get started. And you're saying on one hand, recognize things are very different today than they were, um, but recognize that there are some things that you can do and you need to do uh, to get started. Well, I think the important thing that you talked about, um, you know, in any given situation, there are things that we can control and there are things that we can't. And, you know, as we look at this right hand column, and if you wouldn't mind advancing one more slide, that what we need to do is we need to have an organization that's willing to be adaptable. And the only way we can do that is to be aligned and to do that together. So when we look at the sales environment, how do we operate? And we operate one phone call, one email at a time. We have a strategy and we go out and execute it. And if you wouldn't mind, if we could advance to the next slide, please. So that's kind of the macro picture, Kimberly, as you talked about. As we get into the tactical part of it, my recommendation is the most important thing, and I know this is very common sense, so I don't want to insult anyone, but it's really important that we be mindful that we want to protect the base. And what I mean by that is every company has X percent of their business. We use the 80-20 rule. So 20% of your customers, your clients represent 80% of your business. You want to look at what is that 20%, okay? And how much is that? And those are your high touch ongoing conversations. And you want to be understanding what's happening in their business and collect that market and that customer intelligence and make sure that it's inputted in a CRM in a report where the executives can sit down on a weekly basis and really evaluate what's happening. Because decisions need to be made based upon, you could have one of your largest customers having very difficult time getting materials and they can't fill their orders and guess what, customers are going elsewhere. That creates a very volatile situation for you. So it's a big picture. So the first thing that I would look at is what is your internal capacity as a company? What can you sell? Have you been impacted from a material standpoint? Have you been impacted by a service? And what does that look like? Because in this situation, we want to be looking at, do we need to unbundle things so that we hit a better price point? Do we need to be bundling it up so that we're not allowing the competition to take market share that you could be having. Do we need to be providing discounts, minimal discounts for a longer term commitment, right? That's a really big deal. Or um, should we be empowering the sales organization to have X percentage that they are able to negotiate in the field so we can empower them? This is really important for us to be looking, what is the go-to-market strategy today? Mm -hmm. Right. And when you talk about communicating the plan, which I know is the step you'll get to next, are you talking about communicating that across the organization? Because everyone can be in sales, right? Um, in this volatile environment, we need alignment. So from a manufacturing standpoint, all of the functions, all the different departments need to be on board with how the company is going to market from sales. How quickly can operations respond to get the truck out the door, if you will. Maybe the lead time before was six months, but now in this environment, they can reduce it down to three. That gives the sales organization a lot of ammunition to go out there and sell because the value proposition just got better. So you want to decide what is and is not negotiable and empower the salespeople with that. But importantly, communicate the plan to everybody mm -hmm. and clarify expectations. What's everybody's role? 
because we need to be having one conversation today and it's just in time decision making. That's what it is because based upon the dynamics of the market, we have to shift. Here's what's really important and this is where a lot of people are skipping this step and I think paying the price. Um, the world today is not the same as it was and you need to go back and you need to empower your sales team by training them for what the environment is like today. You need to be upskilling them. You need to be retraining them. Um, maybe in the past you haven't empowered them to negotiate. It's really important that they have that um, authority today. And the reason for that, it's going to reduce your sales cycle and people want decision making now. When they're hot and they're ready to buy, we need to be closing that deal. Mm -hmm. Right? So we need to be training the sales team. How are we going to market? What is our value proposition today? And revisiting what that means and how do you as a sales organization, how do you go to market? And I think in the past, too many salespeople went out and said, this is who we are. This is how great we are. And this is why you should buy us. And I think we need to invert that and say, help me to understand what's happening in your business. What's important to you today? What's the number one thing you want to have happen? I think we have to become better question askers and better listeners and take that information, dissect it, and then say, you know, would you be interested in exploring this opportunity? Because I think there's a way we can help you. Right. Um, be sure so that kind of, kind of uh, feedback loop as well is very important to keeping even business strategies fresh, correct? Correct. As you're getting information from the market and you're bringing it back to your leadership team. I think that's the essential piece. I think that's where your competitive ed edge will come mm -hmm. because when you have your eyes and ears in the market, and let me just share with you, nobody's traveling today. The CEOs mm -hmm. that I'm talking to, they're so excited and they hope to never get on a plane again. Many of them, they're like, are you kidding me? I can save six hours and not get on a plane and have four conversations. Do you know how much productivity I have? Right. So, it's changing the paradigms of how executives are thinking about their job. And Christine, I can't quite see number seven at the bottom, and maybe that's just my screen, but the last point on this slide, can you see it? Yes, I can. So okay. sell when appropriate. So as we're making these calls, protecting the base, inquiring, mm -hmm. asking questions, it's not always that call that you're going to sell. It might be a listening call. Mm -hmm. It might be, connecting with them to make sure that everything is okay or finding out what's happening and teeing up the next call for, you know, I just want to keep tabs on you, make sure things are okay. Um, you know, can we schedule a call in a couple of weeks and just see how things are going for you? Um, I think the most important thing is to show you care. This is not about selling. This is about caring first. It's about really listening and learning. And then as an organization, based upon all the feedback that you're getting, how do you go to market? Right. What does that look like? Some great relationship building, some great insight gaining. Christine, those are fantastic insights. We're going to go ahead and pull uh, Steve Palakin, who has spent many, many years in sales and is now wearing the chief marketing officer title with, uh, with Ergens. Steve, it's great to have you here. You know, your team has been so busy and I continue to read in the headlines all of the work that Ergens is doing including finalizing the development of the newest addition to Milwaukee's skyline, the BMO Tower. Um, I wonder if you could kind of follow in the theme of what, what Christine was talking about, really sharing some insights with us about kind of what you're hearing. So as you're reaching out to your customers, what are they telling us about how COVID-19, the social unrest, I mean, 2020 has impacted them? Well, one of the things I think that's fun and interesting about commercial real estate, even in times that aren't fun, is the fact that we provide a service to so many different industries, an integral service. We provide the space for all types of companies. And even though you can differentiate yourself with intangibles, what that space is like, quite often it comes back to the physical aspect of the space. So the immediate thing that we heard from so many different types of industries, companies, et cetera, was about safety and wellness. 
what can we do? What can't we do? Now, what's interesting, I think, is the fact that, as I mentioned, there's so many different types of industries that we deal with that there is no one answer. Uh, there were some companies that said, hey, can I get into my office and continue work as usual? And we're balancing the safety, the cleanliness, and the guidelines from various institutions about what you can and can't do. We also had other companies in retail that said, okay, we're done. Uh, we're just gonna put the world on pause. You have to deal with that. And we also had industries that were actually busy, certainly those in the healthcare industry. So what I'm feeling about this is there is no one answer that works for everyone. And it led, me to the conclusion in terms of marketing and sales that the single best thing anyone can do right now is to be aware. Mm -hmm. Pay attention to what any individual in front of you at any given moment is asking and going through. You certainly don't want to be selling something to someone that's breathing. You certainly want to be there to provide the services that people want and assure them that they'll get those. And uh, there are so many different lines of industries and uh, of the workforce that have to go on. As you referenced, uh, we're in the midst of completion of construction on a major high rise building that had to get done and it impacted various people in different ways. So there is no one size fits, fits all answer, but what's really fascinating is even though there is no one size fits all and you have to be aware, there's no exception. There isn't anyone that wasn't and isn't impacted by what's going on today. So it, really cause us mm -hmm. to be aware and communicate with everyone that we come across. You know, some people might be saying, what a relief, there's no one size fits all um, anymore because it means I can put my ear to the ground, I can listen uh, as Christine talked about, but it also means that we can get a little bit creative, right? We can get innovative. So in addition to completing the development of that amazing, you know, building the BMO Tower here in Milwaukee, you also have to lease that building. So I wonder if you could take us through the steps of some innovation you've had to, uh, to do some thinking about and to put to work because you're not bringing people in anymore for in-person tours. You're absolutely right. And uh, the easy answer to that is, okay, let's go virtual. Uh, virtual is just such a, a, a strange word. Uh, it's actually something that, especially in the real estate industry, it's been used for years. You can uh, uh, take someone on a virtual tour of almost anything. But virtual to me means flexible. And if you have something to share with someone, if you have a message, if you have a visual, then you have to be open to as uh, was already referenced earlier, between Zoom calls and not traveling, how do you get in front of someone? And specific to BMO Tower, we actually first started by defining what is our message? What is it that will resonate with people? It's not just, oh, here's a 25 story building that you can't miss. We actually have some things that we wanna show people that are unique, especially in this time period where we're dealing with issues that are concerning everyone. Uh, we're talking about a brand new building here. So we want to take people into this building in whatever way is comfortable. We can do that physically. We can do that virtually. But what are we telling those people? And especially being aware, as I mentioned earlier, and being sincere I think people have a fear of coming into a workplace or any building. And one of the main advantages of BMO Tower is we're talking about brand new space. And brand new equals clean. And clean equals safe. So there's the comfort though. There aren't any plants hiding in the corner for 15 years that may be breeding who knows what. You're talking about a touchless experience 
where we have elevators and other aspects that allow you to move around very easily. We are starting with brand new space that's clean continu continuously. And we have social distancing built in. Probably the most important aspect is the fact that our heating, ventilating, air conditioning is brand new and state of the art. So we set out to figure out how do we reach people flexibly with that message in whatever way works for them. So we use Zoom calls, everybody's comfortable with it now, and we had people placed throughout the building and actually took people on tours and showed them firsthand what this is like. We produced a series of videos that also will very, very quickly show you what these aspects are of the building that are unique and that allow you to see space. But, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier, which is there's no playbook. And mm -hmm. respectfully, uh, Christine nailed it, but you also said that we haven't lived through this. Uh, I've lived five times longer than you guys. You're all virtual youngsters. There's stuff I've seen. I have seen similarities without the playbook to this. And that means that going back to awareness, what you really have to do is sincerely communicate with people and share with them what your message is, what you'd like them to know, and what's important for them to know. And the more that you share with that sincerity across any platform, I think social media is a misnomer. Social media is not a place uh, to just debate and share pictures. Between LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera, what it is is a platform. And just as you mentioned, uh, if CEOs are open to Zoom calls, everybody's open now to whatever's most convenient for them to just hear about something. And that's what you have to do in this day and age. Nobody's exempt. It's a, it's a strange time. And it's really time to communicate. Steve, I want to ask you a quick follow-up question to that. And, and uh, I've got about a minute before I've got to jump over to talk to James. But, um, you, you know, you've talked about listening. You've talked about being very responsive. You know, I'm wondering about, um, you know, as, as we're considering the change in the sales pitch today, you know, how important it is for people in business development or how important is it for people in business development to be taking kind of into account people's confidence and trust and building that uh, today in terms of, of what you're offering? Because you know, we, we talked, and I'll just mention briefly, we talked with some economists a few weeks ago. We talked about the psychological side of the uh, rebuilding the economy and that lack of confidence, that lack of trust is a big barrier to that. So how, how important is it, is it for you to take that into account? Well, I'm an eternal optimist. Uh, I've always thought that our economy is healthy. It reacts to external events. That's what I've seen in my lifetime. I've never seen an unraveling of our American economy. It's very resilient. Uh, I do think, to your point, Kimberly, that the best thing to do is to provide assurances. Uh, I began at the onset by saying that we were hearing from tenants of what do we do. The first thing we had to tell them is we're not going anywhere. We're going to be here for you. We are going to use our expertise and we'll get through this by making sure that we communicate. And by, and, and uh, as Christine mentioned, your base. You know what our base is? Uh, our base is providing quality product that exceeds what people want. And I think you have to be true to that and true to those assurances, but at the same time understanding that what you're communicating about today may not come to fruition. It may have a gestation period that gets us through something that there's none of us that can truly predict what next week is going to be like. So it's providing that assurance. Patience, which is not always easy to come by in folks who have business development or sales in their title. Steve, those are great insights. Really, really appreciate it. Um, James, Dr. Strange, right? Just putting you on the spot here. <laughs> Love yes. that background. And I want to talk with you about that for just a second. Sure. But, um, you know, those of you who know Kane have 
probably come to know James Burnett. Uh, James is our director of public relations uh, here on our team. He is a previous journalist as well, spent some time with the Boston Globe, Miami Herald, uh, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, um, and also spent time in, in the corporate world uh, and an agency before joining at uh, Kane Communications Group. Um, James, you and I have similar backgrounds and you and I and Steve Jagler, who's also a former journalist uh, on our team have talked about um, you know, having been journalists and now we're in the world of, um, of PR and sales. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about kind of what you learned from your experience as a journalist, how that applies to sales. And maybe as we get into that, the background, <laughs> you know, doctors trained. There's Absolutely. a reason for this, right? There is, there is. So in, in terms of uh, parallels between journalism and sales, um, I, I often tell people about a couple of anecdotes that um, a mentor of mine gave me at the start of my news career. One was that, um, one thing he said to me was, uh, James, we can teach anyone to write, whether it's for a print or broadcast, digital, we can't teach everyone to report. The parallel for sales is that uh, we can teach anyone to do the tactical things that their job involves. We cannot teach them uh, certain instinctive things to relate to other people, to convince them that they should do business with you. And I think that's the first uh, thing that I brought over with me. Uh, the second is that um, I had a professor who once told me when you get into journalism and eventually if you ever move into other areas of communications work, um, we all have to have a little bit of Sherlock Holmes in us. That was his, uh, his line and it took me just a little to understand what he meant, but uh, it really broke down to engaging people in a way that makes them comfortable and figuring, reading between lines and figuring out what it is about themselves that we can relate to um, what about themselves? Um, we have similarities, uh, uh, shared interests, um, shared beliefs, uh, shared hobbies, whatever the case may be, anything that can bring them to a place that they're comfortable with you enough to allow you to talk about your brand, your good, your service, your product, whatever the case may be. And sometimes a little bit of humor, you know, can, uh, can create a, a quick connection between yourself and, and somebody you may have never spoken with before. Absolutely. Um, one of the examples that I use that has actually served me really well in uh, pursuing sales and uh, did in previous jobs uh, before I joined Kane Communications Group is uh, early in my news career, I wanted uh, to land at the Philadelphia Inquirer for reasons that I won't bore you all with. I approached a, an Inquirer recruiter at a news conference and uh, not an actual press conference, but a convention of uh, news people. And um, I noticed walking up to him that he was wearing uh, Stacy Adams shoes. Uh, my grandfather was a fashion plate in his day and he always wore Stacy Adams. He had a closet full of them. And so I noticed the Stacy Adams shoes and I called them out to the recruiter. And uh, we spent the next hour talking about quality men's shoes. That was our conversation at the end of the conversation. I told him, you know, wait, don't walk away. Uh, can I tell you about my reporting, my ability, my skills? And he said, I'm already convinced of that. I just needed to know if you were worth talking to. That's great, so, a simple point yeah. of connection. You know, when, when you work as a journalist, um, you have the advantage of, of people really, for the most part, returning your phone call, right? Sure. Uh, either they want the attention that a new story you're doing is going to give them, or they're afraid of not calling you back because of what you might write about them. Sure. Um, you know, when you're, when you're in business development, when you're in sales, that's a little bit different. It can be a little bit more difficult to get folks to pick up your, your phone call or return your phone call. You know, this is where I think you find, you know, your reputation um, comes in, um, your name, your company's name. Uh, they play a very important role. So I wonder if you could talk about the importance, James, of building that personal brand uh, for individuals who are in sales and business development to get the phone calls returned. Absolutely. It, it's hugely important. Uh, credibility is everything when you're trying to um, reach someone uh, uh, on a sales uh, call or make sales outreach. Uh, credibility is absolutely everything. And if you don't have a brand, uh, people don't have anything to measure you by. Uh, so it is important that you do a few simple things to build that brand. Uh, these days, especially now that we're living at least temporarily in a virtual world, uh, you need to be active on social media. 
I can't tell you how many executives I have met who have uh, been dismissive about social media as a place, uh, as Steve alluded to, um, uh, to share pictures and have uh, political debates. And it, it's so much more than that. There are untapped audiences and potential uh, customers and clients who are looking and uh, in some cases don't even know that they need to hear from an expert in a particular sector or from a particular company. And the executive who takes the time to build a presence on social media um, uh, to demonstrate expertise in uh, his field and um, at her company uh, is the executive that will have a leg up on rivals. Creating a personal website is a, uh, another simple uh, and easy and effective opportunity. It is a place for uh, uh, business executives to, to park their personal brand and to cultivate it at their own pace and uh, in a way that they're most comfortable uh, if they have uh, professional writing that they have posted to uh, trade publications, if they have uh, personal insights to their business or to themselves, to their own personality, a personal website is a place where they can house all of that information. And again, you build a presence online, search engine optimization, et cetera. Uh, at some point, people will begin to see you in their results as they're searching for certain types of information. Uh, getting your work published, I uh, mentioned trade publications. It's um, a badge of honor for an executive in any field to be able to express um, insight or, or maybe foresight um, in markets like today's uh, about their sector and about their business in particular, how they own space in their particular sector. And I, I think the fourth point, uh, last not least, uh, establishing yourself as a community leader. So many executives uh, put time into uh, their business. They put time into uh, directly into generating sales and to building a rapport with their staff, with their own employees. And they fail to realize that one of the biggest drivers for your sales or in terms, in terms of credibility is where you stand in the community. People wanna know that you're not just occupying space in their community, uh, that you're not just visiting a building every day from nine to five, but that you're an active member of the community. And I know that instinctively, we have this puritanical bent that says, don't brag. This is where you wanna brag. You wanna talk about what your company, what you do in the community, how you're contributing, and uh, even generate conversations about things that your community needs, interests mm -hmm. that it has um, collectively, and uh, where your organization might play a role. James, I wanna talk, go back to a couple of points that you mentioned around kind of publishing and content. and. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for the past five or so years, we've seen a lot about content marketing. Um, you know, these are direct kind of lead generation emails and other content that gets sure. pushed out to generate leads. But there's a new kind of content that's beginning to emerge uh, that I know you're very involved with, and that's brand journalism. Um, can you talk a little bit about what distinguishes content marketing from brand journalism and the role that brand journalism is beginning to play today in building people's credibility? Absolutely. So the, the biggest difference, as you uh, suggested, Kimberly, is that content marketing is meant to fuel sales. Um, it is meant to provide uh, useful information, and you can read into that practical information for potential clients about your product or your service to let them know what it can do for them. Ultimate goal, uh, we want to generate new leads and uh, make sales conversions. The difference with brand journalism is it is not contingent upon the quality of your product or service. Of course, those things are important, but brand journalism is to help define your brand, to help define you, to help inspire or influence uh, credibility and comfort with people um, in you and in your product. And ultimately, the opportunity with brand journalism is to own your story. Um, and by own, I mean take control of your story from the very beginning and determine the direction it goes rather than waiting for legacy media outlets, uh, newspapers, television stations, magazines, to report your story and hope that in the process they get it right. This is not to take away anything from our former peers in media, but they are busier today than they've ever been. Uh, they have less bandwidth, fewer resources. And um, while you may come across, to, across a journalist who is absolutely interested in what your company has to say, what you have to say, what you are selling, 
it could take them forever to get around to that story. So it's really important to take this opportunity to use those proven techniques and styles uh, that traditional journalists, journalists, legacy journalists use and tell your own story at your own pace on your own platforms. And what you'll often find is that it will inspire traditional journalists to come back to you later and say, wow, you've done my legwork for me. I know more about your company, about the product or service that you're selling than I might have had I tried to hammer something out quickly in the beginning. Good stuff, great insights from all of you. Um, let's go ahead and bring in some audience questions. We've had quite a few um, pop up in the chat window. Sarah, do you wanna take us through a couple of the questions that, uh, that you think we wanna tackle right off the top? Sure, there's one right here um, from an audience member, kind of shifting gears a little bit, um, more toward, uh, so get our brains in the mindset of, uh, sales team. Um, an audience here um, asks, uh, we're interested in learning about team building ideas to use during the pandemic, particularly the sales team. Is there anything that um, you've done, Steve or Christine, that maybe you've recommended to sales teams to help gear them up, build the team, um, and really motivate them during this time? Any suggestions? One quick thing I can interject, and it's about the marketing team at Ergens. What we did at the onset of this was to commit to each other that we would meet via Zoom or Microsoft Teams, platform doesn't matter, but we set up a daily check-in. And as simplistic as that sounds, uh, we were used to seeing each other by uh, grabbing somebody when you needed them or walking by in the hallway. But having that specific check-in time every day has kept us, mm -hmm. uh, the cliche would be closer, but the reality is it's kept us on top of everything, which is probably the easiest thing to lose mm -hmm. when working remotely. Christine, what are your thoughts? Oh, you're on mute. Christine, you're on mute. There we go. There we go. go so sorry, I did that. Um, I'm going to dovetail what Steve said, and I would say the daily huddle. There's nothing more important than the daily huddle. And there's a couple of different ways that you can set it up. Um, at the very beginning of COVID, a lot of the sales teams that um, we were working with, what we did is we set up, how are you feeling today? because a lot of people had to shift their roles and become school teachers and become the spouse who's home now when not usually that's home and it created some dynamics. Some people didn't have large homes where they could have offices, so they were moving in and out of the kitchen and there were different stressors. So just having a moment to have everybody check in and say, first of all, how are you feeling? Because there's some nice conversations that can happen after that or during that to say, man, I love you. I had that yesterday. You've got it. I'm sorry. You know, didn't mean to be contagious in that respect because didn't want to share that with anyone, right? And you laugh about that. Um, what are you hoping to accomplish today? What's your goal? And, um, and then um, what's one thing you want to say to the team? And then at the end of the day, before you close, you do another little quick check-in to say, okay, how are you feeling now? Because the end of the day is really important because you're going back into the family. Um, what did you accomplish today? I happy, sad, whatever, you know, no, I had this, I wanted to get it done. I didn't get it done. And you know, you have the, 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 the commiseration party, but what's really nice about that is it's keeping people together in a heart connection as opposed to just get the work done. And I think in this VUCA environment, we need that personal connection more than ever. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just changed some dynamics because not everybody's gonna have a great day. And it was okay for the team to say, it's okay, it's your day. You haven't had one in two weeks. Make it a good one. If you're gonna have a rotten day, make it really a good rotten day and get it out of your system, right? And you laugh and you giggle and, you know, they do all kinds of fun things too. You know, people are putting pictures down. And it, it's really kind of fun, but. Um, I agree, Steve. I think that's one of the best responses that I've heard is stay close. Yeah, and keeping it real, as, as you said earlier, Steve. Um, Sarah, do you want to pull up another question? 
Absolutely. Um, one more here from uh, audience member Erica. Um, I'd like to hear more about the comment on CEOs being more willing to do a 15 minute Zoom call versus face to face. What pitch have you used or heard about that was successful? And is it centered around how you could help because of COVID? Sure. So there's a couple of different strategies that work and it depends upon your industry. I'm, I work in all kinds of industries, so it really depends. Um, I can tell you the folks who are in, I would say, automotive, big trucks, um, what works for them is a five-minute conversation. Because every key decision maker at the top of where they go, and they have different names and titles, owners, this, head of that, whatever the titles are, it's irrelevant. Most people will take a five-minute conversation. And you set it up. I'm going to ask you two or three questions, and then based upon your answers, I'm going to give you one minute. And then if you think it's a good conversation, maybe we can schedule 15 or 20 minutes at another time. And I, I will share with you the success rate of that sales team and taking that approach was amazing. They've had, right now, I think we're tracking about 78% success that within a two to three week time, they were able to get to that key decision maker, whoever that is. Um, others, are using email because the access to those key decision makers has been a little difficult with everybody being at home. And the important thing is the email needs to be very short. The subject matter is um, um, wanting to schedule time. So it's very upfront, there's no manipulation. And you talk about, you know, I'm interested in learning about this, this, and this. Here's what we do. Here's the impact that we make on organizations would welcome the opportunity to have a five to 10 minute conversation. And I'll share with you the success rate of that, not as high, I'm going to tell you, but in a general email, if you get a 7% response when you're doing cold calling, that's good. Um, they're getting much higher than that. They're getting about 15%. So I don't know if people are bored or they're just using a different approach. Great. Looks like there's a question that's come in just for you, Jane. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, go ahead. Sure. Oh, I was just going to say, um, this is interesting, James. Um, looking for maybe a story or an example here from your journalistic past um, mm -hmm. that might help out sales folks or executives who find themselves in this spot today. Uh, journalists often get people to open up to them over the phone very quickly without having that past relationship um, mm -hmm. to build on. Um, do you have any examples of times in your past where you've had to build trust quickly, get people to open up to you? Um, that might be insightful for sales executives who are now in that spot without being able to establish that face-to-face -face relationship. Sure, sure. So, um, and Kimberly knows this, uh, you know, journalists uh, have areas of uh, coverage, uh, they're beats. Um, my my uh, first beat was uh, crime, uh, law enforcement, the legal system, uh, the court system, and um, the lessons that I took from that informed all other reporting that I did subsequently, including on business development. One thing that I uh, picked up when covering crime uh, frequently was to establish trust was to demonstrate to people very early in the conversation that I felt what they were thinking sincerely. That applies in business as well. When you have a CEO uh, or any business executive who is um, in a period like the one we're in now that is rife with uncertainty, um, demonstrating to them that you get their angst and their anxiety, uh, that you understand um, the pressure that they may be under uh, goes a really long way. And sometimes it's as simple as an icebreaker. Uh, I, I'm trying to think of a single story uh, immediately after 9-11. Uh, my uh, team and I, uh, I was reporting for the Journal Sentinel at the time. Uh, we went to New York uh, to track down a couple of firefighters who had ties to uh, the Milwaukee area. And there were people there who wanted to talk about certain things, understandably, and uh, did not want to speak about others. And we very quickly had to identify those things that made them comfortable with the knowledge that we sincerely cared about what they had to say. And uh, sometimes those were serious things, sometimes they were not, they were lighthearted. Uh, Kimberly alluded to my background earlier. Um, my, I'm a comic book nerd. 
Uh, I love Marvel, Marvel comics. Sorry if uh, you're a Superman or Batman fan, but I can't <laughs> do the DC thing. So um, this is the uh, Den in uh, Doctor Strange's house from the uh, movie set. And uh, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with executives uh, that I managed to get from a phone call into a Zoom meeting and immediately drew their curiosity. And I uh, said, it looks familiar, it feels familiar, I'm stressed out, but let's pause for a minute, tell me about that background. And I told, tell them, more often than not, they said it related to their children, not themselves, but um, we were still able to talk about that and open doors to other areas of conversation. But I'd say that's what I pulled from journalism. Um, the ability to, the necessity, not just the ability, the necessity of uh, convincing people that you care about what they're feeling and why. The other thing I, I might add to that is um, the importance of doing research. You know, mm -hmm. when you and I were, were journalists, uh, James, we we were often sold to, right, by folks who wore the title yes. public relations. And, sure. you know, when, when we had people pitching to us as, as journalists who did their research, they'd, you know, read the last stories that you had written and they resonated or they watched the last stories that I put together and they resonated. So when you're reaching out to someone, I think even in sales today, saying, I read this news article about you or I looked at your LinkedIn profile and this is really interesting. These are the things we have in common. Um, doing your research ahead of time, um, you know, I think is is really, really critical. We found that in journalism and, and I think we find that in sales. Yeah. It, the it, new but, question, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say there absolutely is a definite parallel. I could always tell the difference if I just wrote a, a story about a half billion dollar real estate development and then I got a pitch from a public relations person. This really happened, uh, by the way, um, telling me about their new line of bejeweled dog collars. I mm -hmm. knew that they had not read anything that I'd written mm -hmm. recently. And uh, I immediately deleted their pitch uh, because I just simply wasn't interested. And there is a parallel to sales for sure. People want to know that you understand their industry, their business. And again, that you care about what they do. You know, I wanted to interject, and it's a little counterintuitive to what we're talking about of how to navigate this current period of time. But James and I bonded a lot better at a Brewer game than we would have by, you know, getting an email from him that says, hope you're doing well during this period. Uh, and the substitution of that limitation of actually, you know, sitting down at a ballpark and, you know, two people getting to know each other. There has got to be a way that we replicate that today. And if you can't do it exactly, then I think you have to do it with some patience where you realize that you are going to be breaking bread at some point. You are going to be face to face at some point, but just make sure those lines of communication are still open. Yeah. You know, another question just related to kind of broadening out um, as you're as you're looking at at pitching to CEOs or reaching out to prospects or even even former um, customers. How important is it to collaborate with other functions on your team in order to be successful? So I know at Ergens you have a number of different business lines. How important is it for us to be learning about kind of the different facets of our business, our industry? to inform that sales pitch? It's certainly crucial in, in terms of sales and marketing. And, and when you talk about commercial real estate, I mean, you're also talking about so many areas. You know, I proudly say we when I reference Ergens, but I also reluctantly say it because some of the construction people and the property management people deal with things that I know I just couldn't do. And that's where the collaboration comes in, because um, there's an intersection between what we do in commercial real estate and when somebody actually needs us. And it's an ongoing process. And it's, it's sometimes, quite candidly, it's like throwing darts, because you can have physical product, a building or a project that's just beautiful, but if someone doesn't need it for five years, you really have to be talking to them for those entire five years. And that's where the collaboration that you referenced, Kimberly, comes in because our marketing people, our leasing people, our construction people, our development people all know what the totality of that really means so that we can articulate it 
to anyone, and then it comes to fruition at the moment they really need it. Christine, how about um, applying kind of marketing techniques to, to generate sales? So we know there is cold calling and, and pitching and, and that sort, getting out, getting in front of people is one strategy. But how important is it to take a look at marketing techniques to help generate some leads and even warming up the market? Um, really, I, I think it's more essential now than it's ever been. And I think that goes back to understanding what's most important to your clients, customers, prospects, and really spending time looking at what is your value proposition, but not just as you know, pretty language and marketing speak, but rather quantifying it. What is the impact that you make in terms of assisting your customer's business? And everybody should be able to vet out quantitatively. This is exactly the impact that we're able to make with this client and this client and this client, because we're not just about selling this, we're about helping you advance your business success. That's our goal. So the key is how do we do that? And we need to understand your business at a deeper level so we can talk about what is the potentiality of positive impact? So in terms of marketing, um, I think the value proposition is essential. And I think, I think you have to be really creative in what you do in marketing today. I think it has to be more personalized than ever. Yeah. Um, it's not just a mass mailing because people don't have time. It's, it's just like receiving an email. People don't have time. Exactly to your point, James, you want it to be custom designed. Um, years ago, when I first started my business, I was maybe in year four or so, and I wouldn't recommend doing this. I'm just going to share with you a story, though. Um, I was new in the market, didn't know anyone new in the business. And what I did is there were these Dilbert mints, and they had perform mints, improve mints, and achieve mints. And so what I did is I, set, um, I sent a three-part mailer, and I didn't have any return address. And I put a postcard in and the postcard simply said, is the performance of your sales organization, but performance of your sales organization meeting your expectations. And they didn't know where it came from other than Milwaukee, because that's the stamp. The next one had the logo, but no name. And I had achievements. And then the third one. So it was a nice little thing. Oh my gosh, I had salespeople, sales managers calling me and say, I just want you to know I'm every single day I'm standing here waiting for the mailman to come here because I can't wait to see what's inside of it, right? And who's behind um, this, right? Yes. Yeah, so I think we have to get creative and I think we need to personalize it. I think we need to get real. But at the point that you talked about, we also need to laugh. We need to be having fun because it's really heavy stuff right now. Yeah. Some great insights, guys. Uh, we've only got about two more minutes. And one thing that is so important for us, this webinar has been, you know, jam packed with ideas and, and insights. And Sarah, I hope we'll be able to make the PowerPoint presentation available to everybody who's attended. Um, but as you know, we're big believers in, in continuous learning. So let's do a round robin. I'm looking at the clock. We've got about 90 seconds or so. Um, what is something you're reading or someone that you're reading that you think folks who have attended this webinar I should check out. Steve, how about we start with you? Uh, well, since you asked. A recently uh, published author. Come uh, on. <laughs> I would have been disappointed if I didn't see that book, Steve. Uh, I actually uh, have, like so many people, I've been binge watching. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife and I elected to binge watch The Crown and Downton Abbey just to bring some class into how I act personally. And it's, it's really been enjoyable to have that diversion. Love it. Christine? Yeah, I actually put three books up. Um, so I don't know if you have that slide here. I hope we don't have a slide, but we'll make sure to get it out to everybody in, in uh, follow up. Okay, sorry. So, um, sorry, I thought they were there. So let me get that, the names exactly. Actually, I probably can show them. Why don't you go to James and I'll actually get the book. So why don't we do that? John, an avid reader and writer as well. James? Yes, yes. So uh, I have to say right now I'm reading fiction. So um, I am reading Fair Warning. It is the uh, latest Jack McAvoy novel, uh, ironically, about a former reporter named Jack McAvoy by the uh, crime novelist Michael Connolly. So okay. always That's good insights perfect. there. And it t takes us away from some of the some of the stress of the day, perhaps. 
Exactly. Christine, perfect timing. Yeah, so um, this book called Mindset by Carol Dweck, I will share with you, is one of the best books and I wish I had read it 20 years ago when I started my business because it talks about a fixed mindset and um, a growth mindset. And I think every business leader and every sales professional should read this because mm -hmm. we encounter both these people every day and we need to know how to interact with them. The second, and this is an old book, um, Jim Camp, Start With No. I didn't know about this. I would have read this about 15 years ago too, as you can see, both of them. I have lots of tabs here, really good information. Love this guy. And the last is Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. Um, I'm sharing that with you because he, get, he comes from a different perspective because he was a hostage negotiator. Um, it's just nice to hear how somebody approaches negotiations different. Fantastic. Some great insights. We're getting thank yous from folks who have joined the webinar. So we really appreciate all three of you sharing your insights, uh, your inspiration and ideas on how we can uh, improve the sales pitch. Thanks to all of you. Now, as we close, we hope everybody who's joined us today will consider joining us for our next webinar, which is on Friday, July 10th, where we will um, talk about executive branding in the digital world. In this webinar, we will hear from digital and executive branding experts, as well as executives who have figured out how to create a strong online presence. So I hope you join us for that webinar. And thank you again so much for joining us today. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have Bye. a great afternoon. Bye. Good to see you.